Well, my name is, is Daud Vickery Abdullah. Some people still call me David Vickery, and I answer to both names. I'm the president and CEO of INSEF, the International Center for Education and Islamic Finance, which also goes by the tagline of the Global University of Islamic Finance. Um, I first became aware of Reba Free Ranking um, in the early 90s. I was working on a project uh, in Malaysia a banking project as a consultant and at that time Malaysia had had one Islamic bank as they then called it um, uh, started in 1983 and a decision was made by the government and by the central bank to extend and expand Islamic finance and to encourage conventional banks to open Islamic windows and um, the board of the bank that I was working on the project for uh, decided that they felt obliged to open an Islamic window and naturally came to me as the banking consultant and said, please um, tell us what we have to do to open an Islamic window. And at that time I was completely unfamiliar that something called Islamic finance existed um, and said, well, I have no idea what Islamic finance is, so I have no idea what to do. But they insisted that I try and find out and give them some advice. So very fortunately I was able to make connections with people at Bank Islam in Malaysia. And uh, the journey started then in the early 90s where um, some people uh, very kindly took some time out to explain to me how Islamic finance worked and I became intrigued. Uh, the journey started, I started reading, I started trying to educate myself and most importantly I started asking questions. and. Very soon afterwards, I became quite enamoured with the concept of Reba Free Banking. And as chance would have it, I also met the person who was to become my wife very soon afterwards. And uh, within a year, I'd converted to Islam. So that was the beginning of the journey. Well, I, I think I have two de de definitions. Um, um, I always struggle a little bit to explain Reba Free, um, um, so I have an alternative de definition. So I'll start with the alternative definition. Um, it's about Reba Free Banking, it's about the efficient and effective mobilization of capital for the benefit of the real economy. And that means getting the money to where it's most needed, but where it actually adds economic value as opposed to just financial value. Um, the explanation of, about Reba Free is somewhat more complex, but effectively it's partly lifestyle and it's partly not engaging in rent on money. In other words, money must be used for a specific purpose, it must be used to add value, to add economic value, and it shouldn't be used just automatically to attract an interest rate or get a return where there's no demonstrable value um, demonstrated by um, executing a transaction. So in other words, it's a fundamental difference between the real economy, adding value, and a financial economy where you make money on money, but nothing actually changes. Jobs aren't created, things aren't made, schools aren't built, hospitals aren't built, etc., etc. Yesterday at the University of Texas in Dallas, you quoted a very interesting statistics. Uh, I would suggest that you also share it with us. Yes, um, one of our leading professors and, and several of our research team uh, did an examination of the U.S. economy during 2013 and discovered that uh, through the U.S. capital markets in 2013, about $33 trillion were raised, a, a very significant sum of money, um, considerably larger than the world of Reba Free Banking, which is about close to $3 trillion. Of that $33 trillion, a very, very tiny percentage, in fact less than 1%, actually goes into the real economy. So you're looking at, at in the United States, of that $33 trillion which is raised, 99.2% of it goes into what I call vaporware, goes into the financial economy, goes into constructed off-balance sheet arbitrary deals which add absolutely no economic value to the man in the street of the United States. Uh, and that to me is shocking. Well, 
it, it's uh, of all the, the bad things that you can do, and from my reading of the Quran, sadly I don't read Arabic, so I read the English translation, but the biggest sin you can commit is reba, in other words, paying rent on money, because the obligation of paying reba means that effectively you're committing people to financial slavery. Um, you're forcing them to do some things from which they may not be able to get out of, they may not be able to repay. So it is uh, not just strongly dis discouraged, it's forbidden. Um, you should not be conducting financial transactions or trade which penalize other people or force them into a situation where their dignity and their lifestyle and so on are forfeited because they can no longer have the ability to repay the debt. Well, I, I'm not a Sharia scholar, but I'm not sure it's the normal way of doing things. Uh, uh, you know, the idea of paying a rent on money is contrary to what the Quran is saying and also the, the hadith of the, of the Prophet. And, and therefore, um, I would disagree with that argument, but I've not had that argument before. Um, I think that it's, um, it's important uh, when you're dealing with, with uh, reba free, a RIBA-free environment um, that we understand fundamentally two things. One is a RIBA-free environment actually encourages you to live within your means. It's a lifestyle issue, and it does not encourage you to go into excessive debt. Um, uh, the Quran does not um, avoid debt, it frowns upon it, but it says that if you need to borrow, you need to finance things, that's okay, but you shouldn't do it excessively. I think the second issue, which is very, very important when you compare this with, with, with banks, is that the banks themselves, when they go into this type of transaction, um, I'm no longer convinced that they're actually acting as a financial intermediary. Um, you know, uh, the basis of banking has always been taking deposits and uh, lending out the money. Um, but when you're lending out the money, when in effect you're leveraging your balance sheet, you're actually uh, perpetrating a further crime in that you're creating more money and lending more money than you have taken um, in your deposits through what's called the multiplier effect. And that in, in many ways distorts the economy and stretches the economy to the point where it becomes a financial economy as opposed to a real economy. And, and that is, uh, that's been exemplified by the recent financial crisis of 2007-2008 where this huge debt overhang has effectively condemned um, you know, everybody to uh, various levels of misery as a result of the greed and misappropriation of funds that the banks have, you know, have, have gone into. Um, I think it's extremely, not just sad, um, but I think it's, it, it's almost verges on, on the point of being criminal, um, that they have been allowed you know, to leverage debt to a point where um, uh, if we make a profit as a bank, we privatize it, but if we make a loss, we socialize it, and the taxpayer ends up paying, you know, paying, paying the, you know, paying, <laughs> paying the fine, if you like, which should have been opposed by more prudent management. So, um, I, I disagree with with some scholars who are saying it's okay the way in which we practice as a banking. I think I think that there's a clear line between charging interest and working on the basis of a profit sharing or a risk sharing environment, which is encouraged in the Quran. Um, uh, which is for the benefit of all humanity, so that people actually you know, move, develop and grow, make a profit, but apply that profit effectively and do not get, get drawn into transactions which demonstrate excessive greed. You say that the, uh, your, one of your major objections is the multiplier effect in a RIBA-based banking setup. How would you resolve this and offer an alternative? in a RIBA-free banking setup? Well, I think that you know, the alternative is, is that you've got to go back to a, 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 the basics of the real economy and, and avoid the multiplier effect. Um, and that, simply put, is, is down to some basics of, of education. 
You know, I think the availability of credit, I think the ability to sort of leverage your assets up to the, you know, up to the hilt, but if the value of those assets declines and you're no longer in a position to, you know, secure the debt, um, people need to be educated that this is, this is harmful. So it comes back to uh, a simple question of uh, educating people in basics of financial literacy, particularly in developing countries, but, but also in the developed countries. People no longer understand um, you know, how the financial system works and a level of trust that used to exist in the industry up till maybe 20 years ago when, when deregulation started coming in, that people trusted the banker, that level of trust has been eroded. So I think we have to go back to an atmosphere of re-education um, and teaching financial literacy so that people actually understand that you know, uh, satisfying their demand now is, is, is inappropriate, that they should save for it and then look forward to the benefits and, and not be drawn into immediate satisfaction because they can. And this effectively to me is what I understand by a, by a reba free lifestyle, that you, you, you live within your means appropriately. I think there are many, but the biggest one um, that I come across in business uh, is still that people who are non-Muslims feel they can't participate in this um, be because of the perception that it is, it's Islamic banking or it's reba free banking and it's therefore for Muslims only. I don't think it's as bad as 20 odd years ago when I first came into the industry, but there is still this, this fundamental misperception that um, because I'm not a Muslim, I can't do it, and therefore the benefits of it are, are, are you know, not available to me. And of course the opposite is true. This is available for everyone. I think that's the biggest misperception. In relative terms, 50 years isn't so long. I mean, we may be frustrated that 50 years is a large part of a lifetime and, and, and we haven't seen the changes. Um, I would dispute that, we, that um, in, in so far as saying, I think some changes have been coming about. What you're dealing with is a system which has been around for many hundreds of years where interest is charged and there is leverage and there's excessive leverage on, on, on debt and, and you know, we've we, we moved into post-crisis this whole idea of printing money and quantitative easing. Um, the challenge is is twofold. One is education from the bottom level up. In other words, as I've mentioned earlier, getting people to understand the reba free lifestyle and so a level of financial literacy. I think that the, the second issue is top down, where you need to be able to get the message across to governments and regulators that the old system, the conventional system, has failed and will continue to fail and getting the point across to the regulators and to governments is now the key challenge as far as I'm concerned. There are concerns about debt overhang, there are concerns about printing money, excessive debt, quantitative easing, but in terms of having a rational alternative, I think the onus is on us now to demonstrate how we could achieve that rational uh, alternative through uh, risk sharing, through dynamic changes in liquidity management at national and international level, through changes in monetary policy, which effectively change the metrics. You know, when you've got a, an interest-based system and you have a, a risk management system from BIS, the, 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 the Bank of International Settlements and the Basel Committee, which is based on an interest system, the risks are seen differently, whereas if you're looking at things from a REBA-free standpoint, the risks or the risk sharing um, is fundamentally different from what has been you know, prescribed for 200, 300 years or more. So in order to change this, we have to chip away at the bottom and work upwards, but we also have to change uh, the policy views of major governments uh, and even minor governments um, to take the risk that there is an alternative system and if they change their monetary policies they could actually reinforce an alternative process. 
My suspicion is that you won't get that change coming from a, a major Western government, the United States or in Europe, but there is a strong likelihood that uh, an upcoming economy, and Malaysia may be the example because Malaysia has, is furthest forward in Reba free banking, Islamic banking, that there may be some policy decisions made there where the monetary policy changes and thereby the dynamics of risk management from risk transfer and risk shifting to risk sharing will be apparent. Last year in Malaysia, they passed the Islamic Financial Services Act 2013, and that shows some early indicate, indications that Malaysia is moving in that direction, that it's moving in a risk-sharing direction, because here in this act, it was quite clear that if you place a deposit in an Islamic financial institution or RIBA-free institution, you have a clear choice that you either invest or, or you place the money with them for safekeeping, or if you invest with them, you can expect a profit or loss return, but your deposit is not guaranteed. In other words, um, you need to understand the risks that you're taking and the investments that the bank are making to secure any returns. And I think this is the beginning of the step forward. But it, it may be another 50 years, but we have to persist and we have to keep moving. And I think the more and more people um, and I meet a number of leaders around the world, governors, uh, thinkers, thought leaders, major economists. M increasingly, they are concerned that the system we have right now has failed and will continue to fail, and that it's an exercise in futility to keep moving from the 10-year cycle, the 10-year cycle, you know, from boom to bust or from yeah. crash, that we actually have to change it, and the change probably needs to be one on a reduction of debt, moving to more equity, which is effectively risk sharing, and eliminating as far as possible the policies of risk shifting to those people who are least able to bear the risk. How can we change the perception amongst the majority of the public that anything with the word Islamic is suspect, is expensive, is just using religion as a, an article of commerce to generate more profits? That is an excellent question. The simple answer is that we have to have the demonstration effect. In other words, you need to show how it does it. You know, so if, if, if profit is made or returns are made, demonstrate how it is made. You know, for example, if you invested a million dollars in the Dow Jones Index in 2003, and invested a similar $1 million in the Dow Jones Sharia compliant Reba Free Index in 2003, 10 years later in 2013, you would have been $119,000 better off if you'd invested in the Sharia compliant stocks. That's an example. I, I think the key, uh, Dr. Yahya, is, is, is very clear. It's a demonstration effect. I think the public at large have probably not had enough engagement with those people who are working in the Reba free space um, to really understand the issues. And we have not, as an industry, spoken to the listening of that audience as clearly as we could or should. And that's an area where we do need to brush up on it so that we get the dem demonstration effect messages across. But it's one of being persistent, speaking to the audiences listening, engaging with them, and also, uh, you know, changing the perceptions. You know, per perceptions can only be changed through education. And, and to me, education has two roles there. One is you educate, so people, I would say, go to school or they learn. Um, they learn the truth or they learn the facts or they learn how to analyze the facts. But it's also an incumbent upon those people who have learned those facts to use them effectively um, and, and to answer back the criticism. So I'll give one example. Many years ago, it was about a decade ago, I was interviewed live on Australian radio. I was in Kuala Lumpur. I think I was being interviewed out of Sydney. A very interesting 30-minute radio program on Reba Free Banking, done very constructively by a very intelligent and capable financial journalist. At the end, there was a phone-in series of questions. And a lady rang in and said, I'm an Australian housewife, this sounds really good, quite interesting. 
but as an Australian woman, would I be allowed to open a Reba Free bank account? And I stopped and thought about this, and I thought, well, we've had a very constructive discussion. Why is she asking this question? So I asked her, why are you asking this question? And she answered and said, well, in Saudi Arabia, women aren't allowed to drive. And I said, aha, that's nothing to do with the Quran or Islamic finance. That's a local tribal custom in Saudi Arabia. Um, it's an actual fact, Islam encourages women to be independent and to run their businesses. And if you, if you look at, at the history of Islam and our prophet, uh, Muhammad, peace be upon him, he married uh, uh, quite a well-to-do and wealthy um, trading lady. She ran a trading business and, and Khatija, uh, peace be upon her as well, um, ran a very successful business. And indeed, under Islamic law, she was entitled to all the benefits of the property that she owned um, and it couldn't be taken away from her if her husband decided to take it away. And she said, well, that's very interesting. And I said, yes, what's more interesting is in my country, and that's England, those rights weren't enshrined in women until the passing of the Married Woman's Property Act in 1925, which was in effect 1300 years after the prophet had done this under Islamic law. And I think that's an example of when you know the facts, you push back on these questions diplomatically and clarify the situation. Because very often there are enormous misperceptions because people just want to listen to the sound bite and not listen to the truth behind the matter. Watching social cultures change and the modern of change of social cultures, one important factor has been the use of stories and movies, and books, and TV, sitcoms to do that. The examples, if you want to promote using Mercedes, then it will be a famous movie with high profile stars. If you want to promote a major bank in the West, uh, in England, or the United States, then a couple would go down and have a conversation. Why is it that the Riba Free Bankers, uh, who are well endowed financially, haven't done that so far? The answer, I, I, you know, I think from my personal experience is that I, I think there's, there's no shortage of desire to do that kind of thing. But I rather suspect that the control of the, the media or the industry has prevented um, prevented it. I'm not saying there's an absolute blackout on it. But I think that there may be, you know, some inclination well, to I'm spread a different about, story. Uh, look at funding a movie, uh, right. funding a TV program. Uh, well, that I, is here yeah. on presenting. Well, if you are a yeah. young man and you're a young woman, want to get married, don't have money, come. We'll finance you the Ripa Freeway. Yeah. And uh, you know, show the the the, the real uniqueness of dealing. Yeah in a river free format and so on. And it's very simple, it doesn't cost that much money, and it's not done. Yeah. We're, just, we're yeah. just beating uh, the drums in the wrong places and talking to ourselves yeah. in the river free format. I, 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 think, uh, I think what you say <coughs> is, is, is probably true. I, I, I think that maybe people jump ahead two steps and say if we did this it probably wouldn't be aired. Um, there's no reason why it shouldn't be done. There's certainly no reason. There's no money. You know, not a. It's not an issue having not having the financing to do it. And I think that we've got to uh, that we do have to go in that direction to get the messages across. Um, a campaign started last year in Malaysia at the Global Islamic Finance Forum, which represents Reba Free Banking, and it was called hashtag Why Not Capital Y N O T I F Islamic Finance. And, and part of that campaign, uh, which was suggested, was interviewing major entrepreneurs, uh, Warren Buffett, Richard Branson, Tony Fernandez, and so on, and asking them, you know, why aren't you using Islamic finance? And actually some of them would answer to say they are, and asking them the reasons why they're doing it. And certainly in the case of Tony Fernandez, who runs the largest, um, you know, budget airline in the world, Air Asia. Um, you know, he would answer price. It was more competitive pricing. And that's why I, I chose to lease aircraft is, is Islamically. And I think that's something that we can also use. So besides showing the movie and telling the story, the human interest story, 
I think we've got to target people who don't understand this with simple messages. As I said, speaking to the audience is listening. If you have serious business players who are saying, I do this because it's good for business, then you will actually get more people following quicker than trying to discuss with them the real meaning of RIBA or, or, or not. You know, eventually you will have to teach them, but you will get the initial engagement because people are looking at this as something which is good for doing business. It, it, it's productive, it's effective, it's meaningful, and it makes a difference. I've um, been engaged as uh, a fairly senior person in the conventional bank and I've been the CEO of two Reba Free Banks, Islamic banks. I, for me, the simple difference is this, and I'm echoing what my customers said to me. We got out there in the streets and we understood their issues. We, we connected with the customers, particularly in their financing. We understood their needs. We visited their premises if it was a business. Uh, we understood their cash flow, we understood their business process, and we lent or financed on the basis of having an understanding of the business. Now, I'm old enough to remember um, my early days in banking in the late 60s and early 70s in the UK, where traditional branch bankers went out and did that in the conventional world. And then it all became automated and, you know, balance sheet and have you ticked this box and have you got this percentage of credit score. My customers when I was running Islamic banks a decade ago would often say to me, you're the first senior banker who's ever come to visit me. You're the first senior banker who's tried to understand what's happening in the community. You're the first senior banker who's tried to engage in understanding how my business is run, and I feel much more comfortable with that. Otherwise, it's just been a conversation through email or through submitting forms. So for me, it is simply about the engagement. It's about sharing in the risk with your customers and understanding the risks they're taking. That's an excellent question, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to not hedge my answer. It depends. I think it depends on the state of development country by country. Um, you know, clearly, if RIBA free banks are just starting in an environment, and the regulatory infrastructure and the liquidity management infrastructure of that country is not geared up to providing the funding for the RIBA free banks, then there has to be more linkages. Because if you don't engage with the non reba free banks, then your likelihood of survival is, is limited. Whereas in a more mature environment, and Malaysia's been doing this for 30 or 40 years, you've actually got a regulatory framework which addresses both and clearly separates the two. And looking at the development where you had one Islamic bank, then two, and then windows were opened, and windows were discouraged, and subsidiaries opened, and now we're moving from subsidiaries to you know, full-fledged separate banks. I think it is possible to move to a system where um, effectively you know, the assets and liabilities are ring-fenced and the, um, the liquidity management is ring-fenced. But when it comes to cross-border liquidity, this is a challenge. You know, this is moving the money from one continent or country to another to where it's most needed. You still have a dependency on A, um, liquidity instruments and the rules which are applied to them by the Basel Committee. And you also have um, limitations through the payment networks. You know, the only Sharia compliant payment network run by a bank globally is with Standard Chartered. There is no other. So effectively this huge dependence on one international bank to move your funds around it, it is a restriction. So I think the answer clearly for me is it depends, but as we move forward then you will see this as predominantly a separate system but it will need to link with the conventional worlds in terms of payments and in terms of liquidity management. How would you approach the Western world where there are very sophisticated and advanced compliance rules to protect the consumer uh, expressed in things like Regulation Z or the Truth in Lending Act where things have to be expressed regardless 
as a percentage where uh, if you invest money you have to tell the consumer how much you are paying him or her after six months or one year or three years. How would you address that as a riba free banker? How would you resolve this challenge? The, the answer I give to that, and it's the answer I think I've consistently given as I've been developing banks uh, around the world in the last decade or so, is that you, you need to work within the system. So, you know, stating that you want to do something as an alternate um, at the outset is not likely to win you many friends amongst the regulators. So you have to see how much you can do within the existing system. Once you have established yourself and the regulators feel relatively comfortable with you, then you have got the opportunity to start pushing back a little bit, but you have to build up that trust and, and level of comfort. Uh, I'll give one example from practical experience. About six years ago, I was invited to assist and advise on the setting up of the first Reba Free Bank in China. This was in uh, Ningxia province at the, in the north, in Outer Mongolia, um, in a city called Yinchuan and uh, where uh, a good proportion of the population of that uh, province, the Hui people, are Muslim. Uh, it's a Muslim majority. So. The challenge there was that this was the first Islamic bank or Reba Free Bank that has been set up. We were limited in the number of products that we were allowed to take to market, and certainly the regulators and the officials in China were I'll put it bluntly, deeply suspicious of anything that we would do, but were allowing us to do something. We had to work within that. We were not in a position to go to the regulator or to the, the government and say, please change the rules to accommodate us, otherwise we won't survive. We had to find a way around, around this. And, and in some ways, um, the way around it was that we had to work in the public interest. There's a concept in Islam called Maslaha, that working mm -hmm. in the public interest, which means that you have got permission um, to do something which is not strictly Sharia compliant, but for a limited period of time, as defined by the scholars, um, in order to get something off the ground. And that's the way we, we, we approached it. Um, you know, we, 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 we weren't, as you call it, bending the rules. We were working within allowed rules, but we um, wanted to establish the bank. The choice was, you either have a Reba Free Bank or you don't. The choice was made, we want one, let's get it established, and then let's try and work on changing the rules. So the approach is, you have to persist, you have to be determined, you must start by working within the rules. Once you work within the rules, then you probably earn the right to be at the table to have a discussion about how the rules may be improved and may be changed. And you can see this, if you look at the UK, for example, they have changed the rules and regulations to accommodate more Reba free banking. They've issued Sukuk last year, they've leveled the playing fields on regulation, why? Simply, the UK government has seen, if we don't implement Reba free banking, the City of London, which is a major financial centre in the world, will be disadvantaged and will not be as competitive as other world centres. And that was what changed it. And I assume you do this all not on your own uh, rulings, but in coordination with a very open-minded and educated Sharia scholars. Yes, I mean, I, I think you know a challenge which I've uh, I've come across over the years is that. Whilst there are some excellent Sharia scholars around, they may not be as familiar as they should be. And, and that's not their fault. Um, I'll take an example. When I ran uh, Hong Leong Islamic Bank in Malaysia in 2005, uh, we had, a, a, uh, because of legislation in Malaysia, where Sharia scholars could not sit on multiple Sharia boards, we started having some quite junior Sharia scholars. And my approach to them was to get them engaged in the business, to teach them the business, so that they could actually apply their knowledge uh, to the way we were running the business. I wasn't trying to influence them um, in terms of please make a decision which you know allows us to do this thing, but I was trying to help educate them so that they understood the business better. So undoubtedly, there is a need on the one hand 
for the Sharia scholars to become more familiar with the business. But similarly, those people running the business in Reba Free need to be more aware of the issues that the Sharia scholars come up with. And, you know, in my, my day job now running INSEF, um, uh, quite a lot of what we do with our postgraduate uh, masters and PhD students is to ensure that they have a good grounding not just in Sharia, but also in the practicalities of running a financial services business. I mean, Malaysia has pioneered now uh, one scholar, one board, so you can't be on multiple boards, so you can't be accused or exposed to, you made a decision in favour on this board and against on that board, because I think that actually does discredit the scholars. Um, and in the main, I think they make honest decisions, but the way it's perceived is that they've made decision A and decision B, but nobody knows the evidence that was presented to them. So Malaysia has got one scholar, one board, and it has a national Sharia board, which sets the standard. So each bank or financial institution has a Sharia board, and it uh, reports into a national Sharia board where if matters of great import come up, then that national Sharia board will, 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 will pass an opinion. Interestingly enough, both the UAE and Oman and other GCC countries are now looking at implementing that two-tier system, where, where they've been vehemently opposed to it in the past. And the reason I think they're looking at it now is because the Sharia scholars have run into some problems because of that point I raised up, that there are multiple Sharia boards and it doesn't look to the man in the street that they're applying the Sharia law consistently. The issue is that maybe the facts of each individual decision aren't being demonstrated. I think the other thing which is interesting in Malaysia now is that it's not just Sharia scholars who are on the boards. It's, 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 it's jurists, it's legal people, people who understand accounting. You know, if I weren't doing the job that I'm doing today, I believe, well, I've been approached, I'd be eligible to sit on a Sharia board, not because of my Sharia knowledge, but because of my practical experience in running and setting up Islamic financial institutions. And this is being encouraged by the central Sharia board and the central bank in Malaysia to get a better mix and feel, the combination of business and Sharia together to opine on the decisions which need to be made. If you were asked to set the guidelines for the qualifications of a Sharia board, like they've done in the United States Federal Reserve System, uh, what these qualifications should be? Well, I, I, I think you, you, you certainly have to have people who are qualified Sharia scholars, so they've gone through you know, the appropriate Sharia uh, training at, at legal school, but I think you also need to have people who are qualified in, in local law. Um, and also people who are familiar with business operations. You know, I don't think that's resident in one individual or one human being, but I think you've got to have this combination of business experience, accounting experience, perhaps even tax experience, and legal experience. Um, you know, if uh, I'm, I'm frequently asked by um, people who are interested in setting up Islamic financial institutions, or countries that are looking at doing RIBA free finance. And I say to them, uh, you know, the, the golden rule as far as I'm concerned is something called STARS, and it's an acronym, uh, acronym that I use. Um, every country has a different starting point with re relation to STARS. The first S is the Sharia and legal environment. The T is tax environment, A is accounting environment, R is regulatory and S is standards, and standards may be product standards or education standards or professional qualification standards. Every country around the world is in a different starting position, and you need to understand that. So the idea of putting in the Malaysian model to another country, or the Saudi model into another country, is without knowing the entry point of stars, is ridiculous. To amplify that, you can look in Southeast Asia. Malaysia has progressed quite rapidly in RIBA free finance. Indonesia, the most populous Muslim nation in the world, has not progressed as rapidly. One of the reasons for that is simply this. 
that the legal system in Malaysia is based on English common law, which is extremely flexible. Whereas the Dutch legal system, as applied in Indonesia, a civil code which requires constitutional change to change the law. As a result, if you look at the first S, the Sharia and legal framework, Malaysia's had much more flexibility to adapt and make the changes required. So uh, understanding the stars, as I call them, as a starting position is critical. And the idea that you can sort of throw in another country's system is erroneous. I think there are benefits, there are things that Malaysia has done which are extremely good, but they don't necessarily apply to a specific country. You know, you can't just parachute in and say, I think it will work. If um, one of the important uh, parts of banking is uh, supervision, bank supervision, and uh, that's done by the central bank, and they send supervisors or what we call bank examiners to examine the bank. Um, how would you feel about also examining the bank uh, from a Sharia standpoint? Because this is a compliance situation. You advertise to the public that you are Sharia compliant and maybe you're just using it as an advertising gimmick to bring people in and you're not doing what you promised you to do. How would you do that? And is it done anywhere in the world? The answer is, well, the second question I answer, yes it is, and it's done in Malaysia. But the challenge for doing it, and I'm again going back now 12 years ago when I was at Deloitte, um, we offered, or I set up at Deloitte, a Sharia <coughs> review process. The central bank at that time didn't have a qualified team that could do a Sharia audit. Now, a Sharia audit is not necessarily about having Sharia experts look at the Sharia. It's about looking at the process and the application of the process in terms of the competency of the people, the processes that are in place, and the technology that is supporting it. And I remember the first Sharia review we did at Deloitte was for a large Islamic financial institution in Malaysia. And we found numerous exceptions but they were exceptions which we expected. Um, you know, for example, they were using old conventional systems and the profit was printed out on the statement of saying interest, you know, but, you know, it, it, that was just a printing thing. Um, the way the, sh the, the Sharia committee interacted with the managing director of the bank was not appropriate, although there was no uh, evidence that anything inappropriate was happening. But the way the processes were set up was that, that if the managing director wanted to push something through and not explain it to the Sharia board, the processes and the, and the checks and balances weren't adequate to protect that. What happened after that in 2002 was that Bank Nagara, the central bank of Malaysia, looked at the procedures we developed and adopted them and put them to place. And when I became managing director of Hong Yong Islamic Bank in 2005, guess what happened? The central bank came in with Sharia review auditors using my procedures to check me. Um, and, and all largely based on the procedures we developed. So the answer to your question, uh, the two parts you had is, is one, is that you do need to build up the competency. You know, if it isn't there, then you need to have some kind of independent review. And a number of companies have grown up around the world who offer Sharia review services. The second thing is, um, going back to the first one, sorry, let me finish that. But I think it's important that the regulator builds up some competency in this area. And, and this is something I'm discussing now in the UK, where they're starting to do more. But of course, the regulator, you know, uh, you don't know what you don't know. And you need to be educated in this area. But I think the second point that you raised was, you know, is it actually happening? Yes, it's happening in Malaysia, where there is... Uh, this is part of the Islamic Financial Services Act and the way in which the process works is there has to be a Sharia review of the processes in place to make sure that everything is in accordance with Sharia as demonstrated or as, as indicated by the financial institution. How, how would you react to a government official telling you, uh, Mr. Vickery, we do not mix 
religion and politics. And we believe deeply in the separation of church and state. I mean, in, in terms of, you know, that question of you know, the separation between church and state or religion and state, you know, we have a real live example of this in Turkey, you know, where, you know, since Kamal Ataturk came to power, there's been this separation between the two. My reaction to that is fine. That's the way you're going to, you know, go, going to go in that direction. But it doesn't prevent you from having RIBA free banking. They've got participatory banking there. They have Sharia boards. I think the issue they have in Turkey is that they, they is an education one. Is they don't have a critical mass of people who are capable um, of growing and developing the industry further. There's a, there's a need to create more practitioners, but there's also a need to create more Sharia scholars or Sharia expertise. I, if, if that's the decision a country makes, and I go back to the question you raised earlier about you know working within the rules, you work within the rules. So those are the rules in the country, and the separation between church and state or religion and state it is, in many countries, perfectly acceptable and quite normal. And I don't think it's our role as Reba Free Bankers to say, well, we can't really move forward until you bring all of that back together again. We actually have to work within what is there, and we will find a solution to it, as indeed we are. Some people are recommending presenting RF banking as a discipline by which you bank, finance, and invest, uh, be presenting it as a religious uh, belief to be executed uh, as part of the religion. How would you feel about that? If you can repeat the question uh, so it can appear on, on camera. Yeah, I mean, the, the question you're asking is, is you know, how, I how I would feel about Reba Fee banking being presented as something which is not necessarily religious um, uh, and more of a you know, a way of life or a, or a, a discipline and approach to doing things. My response to that is, I think if you if you were Muslim, you should certainly be following this way of life. So, to me, there is no question there. The challenge is, of course, educating people you know thoroughly in the religion so that they they effectively. I won't say don't have a choice, but understand what it is they're supposed to do. Um, but for those people who are non-Muslim, then uh, giving it, you know, the that this is a discipline or this is a way of doing things, I think is entirely appropriate. I, I come back to the phrase I've used quite often in this discussion, you speak to the listening of the audience. You know, I, I certainly don't go to audiences in certain jurisdictions or countries and start talking about Sharia law and Islam and Islamic finance. Yeah, you may, uh, you know, I, I talk about risk sharing, I talk about, you know, concepts, I talk about, um, you know, I'm not doing harm to you and I hope you don't do harm to me, basis of golden rule. So I see absolutely no problem in expressing the same thing differently to different audiences. You know, the simple rule for me is if you're a Muslim, then you should be following this, although we both know that there are challenges in explaining to Muslims you know, how, how this works and, and, and we have to tackle that. But for non-Muslims, this is not a compulsion that if you do this you have to convert to Islam because that's not what it's about. It's actually about a, a lifestyle, it's about ethics, it's about transparency, it's about a way of life, it's about living within your means and effectively doing good and making a difference every day. You know, it, it, it's about enabling the change and being positive about enabling that change. People do come to me and say, well, this is not Islamic enough. And, and the answer I have to that is, well, I, I, you know, I'm not quite sure. Can you be specific about why it's not Islamic or why it is? I, I think there are always going to be differences of opinion about where you draw the line um, and, and where you pass the line. But, you know, there are some fundamentals there which I don't think are going to differ. But, you know, in Islam itself there are different schools of Sharia thought, although I would say from studies that were done um, in, in my day at Deloitte, and I'm going back five or six years, 95% of the fatwas in Fuq Muamalat, in other words, dealing with Reba Free Finance, business side of things, all the Sharia schools of thought were in agreement. There was only a 5% difference. Um, but when people say it's not Islamic enough, I, 
you know, the idea of setting up an Islamic state and you've got to have a total Islamic economy um, may be possible where, uh, you know, Iran, yeah, everybody's Muslim. Um, they've done it in Sudan. They've tried doing it in Pakistan and failed, I think, perhaps two or three times there. That may be a way forward. But I think in reality, you've got, you know, Islam lives side by side and also co-mingles quite often with people who are non-Muslims. And therefore, you can't coerce people to follow a particular system. You actually have to have a system which lives alongside. I am not saying you should compromise the values of Sharia here, but you certainly have to understand that if you're providing financial services, they should be available to all on an equable basis. You know, at the end of the day, Islam is for all humanity, Islamic finance is for all humanity, and those of us who are in this industry, and I feel very strongly about this, very strongly, uh, very strongly indeed, that this RIBA free finance is for the benefit of all humanity, but it is our duty, those of us who are engaged in it, to come up with the demonstration effect, to actually embrace it and say it is for everybody and this is how everybody comes into it. I think the moment we start saying this is specifically for this group and it needs to be strong in that way, we start actually devaluing our religion. Our religion is for the benefit of all humanity. I'm saying this because uh, I've had the pleasure of sitting with many scholars and many consumers and they expect a product which is different from what you have in the regular bank. So when you look at the document, what's the difference? It's the same, you know, so it's not really Islamic. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and then uh, you find the objective of the jurisprudence makers is to make it really look different. And when you flush it out, it doesn't look different. So how do you resolve this challenge? Well, I, I always use an analogy here that if you actually look at a, you know, two pieces of chicken, one that's been slaughtered in a halal fashion and one that hasn't, you can't actually tell the difference. You know, there's an element of belief there. Um, but I, I think that only goes part of the way to answering the question that you raised is, you know, what is the difference between um, an Islamic finance product or a Reba feed product and a conventional one? Um, the answer is, in all truth and honesty, over the last 30 or 40 years, we haven't made that much differentiation. Largely because you've got an audience out there which is familiar with the way in which things are done. And it would have been too radical to say, oh, by the way, we're doing something on a, a risk-sharing basis. So I think what we have is, in my mind, Sharia compliant, but the differentiation isn't quite there yet. I think we're now starting to see some differentiation. The Islamic Financial Services Act in Malaysia, where it's quite clear if you're placing a deposit, you're actually opening an investment account and sharing the risk is, is very, very clear. Um, I think that there's uh, the, the biggest success story globally is not in the retail market, but is in the wholesale market and the raising of uh, uh, the, the misnomer is Islamic bonds. They're not bonds because they don't attract interest and they don't behave in the way it's sukuk where large sums of money have been raised in that way by corporations um, and indeed by sovereign entities, and the most recent being, or significant one, being the UK government sovereign sukuk, which was 12 times oversubscribed uh, when it was issued during the, the summer of, of, of 2014. Um, I think that we're now at this tipping point within the Reba Fee industry where we have sufficient credibility that what we've got is viable and it works but we now need to start looking at products which we're designing not necessarily from scratch, but from a Sharia compliant perspective of origination, rather than trying to cop copy other products. You know, we need to be moving towards uh, products which are um, you know, equity based, uh, risk sharing based, and which demonstrate the participative um, impact of bankers and individuals working together rather than saying well this is a mortgage. I think in the past we've had to say it's a mortgage, it's a lease, it's this because people were just confused as to the difference. So uh, I, I'm not sure that the statement that you made where if you go through the detail people say well what's the difference? I think it's a false argument. There isn't much difference. 
um, because we had to copy. It's Sharia compliant, but there isn't this huge differentiation. But now we're established, I think we've got the opportunity to start making these differentiations, and it will appeal more and more. Or, or maybe, like you said, among the scholars, that 95% agree and 5% differ. Uh, the fact that the, 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 the contractual agreements that are used in river-based, river-free banks in, in, a, in a developed society is the distilled effort of the still effort of, of recording history and experience of what happened uh, over the years of the contract that was lacking a certain item uh, or a precaution or a sentence and you keep adding it and that represents human experience and we should look at it this way if it does not conflict with the Sharia. And so th th would that be a way of looking at it? I, uh, I, I agree with you. I think that what we've got is, is, a, is a cumulative experience from you know, the modern era of reba free finance, where we have you know, looked at the, you know, the legal documentation and the product definitions and so on, and we've got this cumulative addition saying, well, actually, this is different. Um, you know, you look, look at the example of, of, of doing a, a, a profit-sharing mortgage, where you know, the title deeds of, of, of the property need to go through the Islamic financial institution because they need to take ownership of it and then sell it back. Now, in many jurisdictions, UK, where I get from, and indeed Malaysia, there was a problem here because you had double taxation because there was a you know a property sales tax and it was being not sold once, it was being sold twice, so it attracted that. A level playing field was created, so I think this is a very good example of how we've got this cumulative effect and, and a level playing field has been created. So I, I I, I think that this is a, a, a topic where we probably pay too much attention to the issue, well, it looks the same. That's not really the point. You know, I think the point is that it is Sharia compliant, and now that we've established ourselves, we can, and, and there's a level of trust, we can now start creating our own things which don't look like anything in the conventional world. I mean, interestingly enough, we're, we're working at INSEF in our research area. We are researching the Ottoman archives and coming up with many instruments which the Ottomans used to run a huge empire, which was financially sound, on Sharia-based rules, um, two, three, three hundred years ago. And a number of those instruments we can dust off and reuse. And the conventional world hasn't used them at all, or hasn't looked at them. And I think we will see these products coming into play with a level of acceptance. So people say, well, now I understand this risk sharing better. But we have to educate the audience that's going to receive them. And this is why I'm saying financial literacy and education is very, very important. You know, because if people don't know what they don't know, they're going to look back and say, well, my traditional mortgage looks like this. So I really don't want to do anything which stretches my brain too much. To, to, to make the change. And the drawing of your two chicken example, yeah. what, what I'm trying to drive at is, uh, it is not only the piece of paper which is called the contract, which is important, but it is the spirit and the process of reaching the contract. Because the contract is like an elephant, or the financial system is like an elephant, and the contract is a tail end of it. But for that whole elephant, and, and the brain of that elephant, and the moving parts of that elephant, is, is a part of a system that, that is not described in the contract, but it leads to that contract. And that's something that I think we may need to, to present river free financing through. This is the whole process of being river free, and it's not just, right. you know, it, it's not just the lifestyle which we've talked about. But the contract is the culmination of a reba free process. What is important, which I think you're alluding to here, is people understanding that the process is different. As I was describing earlier, when I was running an Islamic bank and I went to see customers, this was a novelty. You know, I, I was going there to find out how their business was run. I was looking at you know how they treated their their customers, how they treated their staff. Um, you know, what they did in order to produce whatever it is they were producing. And that doesn't come out in the contract, but it does come out in the human experience. Exactly. And I think this is, 
What drew me into banking when I was 14 years old was living opposite me was a, a very nice man who was manager of the local branch bank in the community I was in. And uh, I went to work for him in summer jobs at the age of 16, but I was just intrigued about how he described his role. You know, it wasn't about counting money, you know, and that you're enormously rich because you've got thousands of pounds, in, you know, in, in the bank. It was about his role in the community of financial intermediation. It was about knowing his customers by name, who their children were, what their business was, what age they were, whether they were going to be educated, might they need some financing to help with the education fees and so on. That's what attracted me to banking in the first place, is that you were paying a pivotal part in people's day-to-day -day lives. You were helping and you were helping people knowing them and knowing them well. Know your customer. And, and he may be a river free banker without knowing it. Well, I think he was, although <laughs> interest was charged <laughs> well, at that time. But, but in terms of the process and in terms of the attitude and the right. lifestyle, this is what drew me into banking at the, at the outset. And 20 years later, you know, I became quite disillusioned with it and left and, and started doing, you know, operational processes. And then I was introduced to Islamic finance. And Islamic finance was like a breath of fresh air because of this fact. It was going back to the reality of dealing with people and their challenges and problems. I think, simply put, the vision I have future is, 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 is twofold. One is that things have to change. We cannot go on in the world using the same system. Uh, it, it, it's broken and we can't keep repeating ourselves. So an alternative is required. However, the second thing I have to say is with that alternative, which I believe is REBA free, we do need to educate more people on how to express it clearly and give the demonstration effect. So therefore, more people who are qualified to express it need to be generated. And we also need to use them and your good self and myself and many of our colleagues who've been in the industry for years to explain the value proposition and to demonstrate the values to governments to uh, regulators and indeed down to individuals and each of us have our own particular expertise and calling in doing this but I think the time is now right uh, post-crisis um, the world is looking for another alternative um, we have a credible one uh, we need to move away from it being a religious based one to being one of a lifestyle or a, a demonstration effect those of us who are Muslim will know it as Islamic finance those of us who are not Muslim should see it as reba free or participatory finance. So I'm not really too worried about what the name is, but it is a change in lifestyle. What we have in the world today is not sustainable if we continue in this way. And I think one of the earliest things I learned from my readings of the Quran uh, and looking at it from an economic standpoint is that the Quran says absolutely nothing whatsoever about there being a shortage of supply. It's all about an equitable distribution. It's about using mechanisms to make sure that all humanity is cared for.